Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. So I was going to do a reply to a video which was itself a reply uh, to my video about Sargon's Five Pillars of Atheism. Um, I'll, I'll link both of those uh, in the description. But, um, yeah, well, well, there's a point or two I'm actually going to talk about that it reminded me of. It didn't seem like a good use of time. It's basically just for entertainment's sake, as far as I can tell. Um, especially because there are a number of points where he criticizes me for something, and then actually plays the part in my video that more or less answers that criticism without any recognition that it did, despite the fact that he said that he watched the video several times. I assume, therefore, that it's really just for entertainment's sake, um, which is what sort of most of the skeptical videos, I think, really are about. Um, so, you know, I, basically, I'm also going to link um, Teal Deer's I Am Become Rationalist Skeptic, which I think is enough of an answer to the video itself, um, even if it's not exactly specific. I will note one other thing about the video particularly, which is that it is kind of amusing to be lectured about morality by a guy who looks like... And granted, it's probably a video game reference, but whatever. But he looks like some guy who is wearing the flesh mask of his first murder victim. Um, yeah. The world's a funny place. Anyhow, uh, so the two things it reminded me of, the first of which being that uh, you sometimes see people talk about how morality is relative because not everybody everywhere has agreed 100% on what is moral and what is immoral. Now, uh, on first blush, this is just profoundly stupid. Um, you know, obviously not everybody has agreed on what the age of the universe is. Doesn't mean that the age of the universe is subjective. So it's one of those things, it's so stupid that I think it's probably them groping for something they don't know how to express and putting it in words that are as close as they can come, probably poetically. Um, and you know, when that happens, it generally tends to sound unbelievably stupid if you parse the words according to the normal English rules of grammar and conventional meanings and so on. I'm still not sure what it is they are groping for. Um, if anyone has an idea, I'd love to actually know. Uh, it, it is very possible that more or less the idea that they have is that, um, well, the first possibility is that morality being relative, um, they're trying to sort of explain that belief this way by, by way of a, a bad example. Uh, a little bit like Douglas Adams and Puddle Logic. Um, another possibility is that they're, they're kind of groping towards the idea that um, without there being consensus, we can't act as if there is consensus. And so we have to instead take some sort of approach that is realistic about the fact that people disagree significantly. Um, the thing is, that doesn't mean very much in practice. Um, I, I think if, if that is the case, it's kind of a symptom of a thing that I've, I've mentioned, I think, before here and certainly in other places, that um, a lot of people were raised for a monoculture, you know, where in general everyone holds the same basic, you know, important foundational beliefs, and they were not given the tools to deal with a pluralistic society in which there are many people who disagree on fundamental levels, and they feel deeply betrayed. Um, a lot of the people you see as atheists, skeptics, whatever you want, they want to call themselves or you want to call them, they, um, a lot of them come out of a fundy sort of background, which is incredibly designed for a monoculture. You don't need much experience with it to see that it is designed only to exist in a place where everybody believes pretty much exactly the same thing and acknowledges only the same authorities and so on. Um, it's amongst other people too, but in general, they have this deep sense of betrayal that in fact there are people who believe very different things and they've got no idea what you do with this. So for a lot of them their basic approach is, okay, how about we compromise? When people disagree we compromise, so everybody give up their beliefs that are contentious and we'll all stick to only those beliefs that everybody holds in common and then they're generally pretty mistaken about what everybody holds in common because there's actually incredibly little that everybody holds in common. Anyway, so that's my best guess. I'd be interested to hear other people's guesses It'll be really interesting if I can someday figure out what it is they actually mean by this. Because they don't think they mean something so stupid that it's kind of implausible they're capable of tying their shoes if they really mean this. It's just generally a good rule to go by uh, in terms of in interpretation. It's not a universal. Some people really will espouse some of the most incredibly stupid things you've ever heard. Like Bertrand Russell in his teapot, for example. But um, 
That's a good roll. The other thing it reminded me of is there are a lot of people who seem to think that an objective morality means one that it is impossible to violate. That it, it's sort of like an extreme form of the agreement thing, that everybody would agree so completely if there was an objective morality that nobody would do anything wrong. Now, that's not what objective morality means. Objective morality means that morality, that there is a universal condition such that doing some things leads to happiness and doing other things leads to misery. That's what objective morality means. I'll, I'll link to my video actually where I talked about this, about natural law and so on, that natural law flows out of what we are and therefore how we are capable of being happy. And some things are compatible with that and some things aren't. And this is true for all of us because we all have the same human nature. Um, and that, that's what makes it objective across human beings. Um, oh, relatedly, some people think that uh, objective morality would apply to like literally everything, no matter what it is. Um, which again is is to misunderstand to not understand uh, natural law morality because natural law morality fo follows out of our nature. This is why, for example, a salmon is not committing fornication by not marrying prior to spawning. It's not the sort of thing to marry, and therefore it's it's not improper that it does not marry. We are the sort of thing that should marry in order to procreate, and therefore it is immoral to procreate without marrying. Um, and I mean that in the the sacramental rather than the legal sense. As long as people bind themselves to each other in a marital fashion, they've confected the sacrament of marriage. That, that basic idea. Um, I'm sketching that, by the way, not, not defining it. Um, anyhow, the, um, this thing, when you look at it, is more or less another one of those misunderstandings of what morality really is. Most everything that people talk about that's wrong about morality all stems from a fundamental misunderstanding of natural law morality. They tend to view morality in a voluntarist fashion, which is how people, not coincidentally, learn morality as children. So for the most part, whenever you see somebody making almost any error about morality, odds are extremely good that the thing you need to do is explain natural law morality to them and explain the concept of human nature. And, um, not, not to rehash things that you, uh, I've said in other videos, but j just real quickly, because it's a good idea not to assume everyone's watched my previous stuff. The only way you get a human nature is by having something that actually creates us according to a human nature. That is to say, God. The problem with... You, you could, in theory, have a natural law morality in an evolutionary, an undirected evolutionary system. I mean. Um, but the problem with that in an undirected evolutionary system is that you don't have anything that in the scholastic sense is a genus. Um, that is to say, there is, there is no kind that we are all in, because the whole purpose of an undirected evolution, I'm sorry, not purpose, but in any event, the, the most important characteristic of an undirected evolution is that every new thing that's born is different. Um, technically, you know, sexual reproduction, etc. Um, guarantees that every new thing is different and therefore there is no common human nature. You can, you know, I'll assume, note some similarities that you happen to have observed in the people that you happen to have checked so far. That's about it. You can't actually know something has a human nature without, you know, investigating because there's no human nature. There are just many, many human natures in that case. And you can see this, incidentally, in the general approach, the idea that that do whatever you like, because that'll make you happy. And there's this blind faith that that actually will, that giving in to your impulses will make you happy. And you can see it right there. The very fact that people are, you know, follow your bliss, as some credit card company said. Um, the very fact that that's what people th think will make them happy testifies to how much they have rejected the idea of a human nature and view instead there being many human natures. Um, of course, the thing is, once you have many human natures, you run into the problems of, well, uh, maybe it is a, you know, rapist nature that they will be happy raping. That this is where, wherein they will find their happiness. This is what is most proper to them. And it just kind of sucks for the other person. And then you get that, you know, the Hobbesian war of all against all. Because when you have conflicting natures, what you have essentially are predator and prey. And then it's just a question of who can defeat whom. You know, can the lion take down the wildebeest or will it get gored? There's no morality there in the common estimation. There's simply who manages to kill whom, who manages to extract their happiness at the expense of whatever. Um, 
you know, and then you just have law being essentially that um, there is commonalities that people so far at the moment seem to find in themselves that, um, you know, I, I don't want this, you don't want this, so let's band together and we'll use our combined strength to try to keep off the, the predators who do want this. Um, now, of course, uh, as I was actually reminded of today in, in a joke where uh, there's a joking thing about a moral relativist saw somebody stealing his car and, and you know, didn't complain because, of course, in that guy's estimation, he was doing the moral act. And there's the thing about moral relativists, though. They do tend to be consistent enough with their moral relativism to realize that it doesn't require them to be consistent, in principle. And so they can just impose whatever they want as much as they can because that's sort of all it ever means. So, anyhow, um, they're just those two things I kind of wanted to clarify. And... Um, as I said, really when you get down to it, I think the, the best approach is simply to explain a natural law morality, and people will reject that. No question. People who believed in undirected evolution will simply reject that, and in fact there is basically no common ground to be had here. Um, kind of sucks, you know, it's nicer when you have common ground. That said, incompatible beliefs are incompatible. And that's kind of the position we find ourselves in. I think the reason the best reason, I mean, to simply explain the natural law is that it makes everything make a heck of a lot more sense. It at least makes traditional morality intelligible. And by virtue of being true, it will at some point awaken something in the person. Um, I, I'm, and there's a really interesting related question that I have no idea what the answer is to. But in general, we tend to, we, you know, Christians, tend to always back off whenever any of the bad things in life happen that show how truly abysmal atheist morality and, and attempts thereon are, and we sort of give them space and, and don't push them at a time when they're hurting. And I always wonder, is that really the right thing to do? Because some people do need to hit rock bottom in order to recover, and so it brings up the question, are you doing somebody a favor by kicking them when they're down? Now, in general we tend not to, and maybe that is for the best. Maybe it is best to, to show restraint there. On the other hand, that may just be taking the safe option rather than the option that actually does a person the most good. Again, I'd be really interested to hear thoughts on this too. Um, it's, it's one of those things that I, I can see arguments in both directions for, and uh, I'd be curious to hear additional arguments, um, you know, for, for both sides, against both sides. So, until next time, May you hit everything you aim at.